Okay, <clears throat> good evening everyone. Hopefully everybody can hear me. <clears throat> I don't hear the clinging dishes tonight, so I think that's a good sign. <laughs> so, uh, welcome to week four of our session. We are in the home stretch <clears throat> for the course. So, as we get started tonight, um, I wanted to, to make sure we talked about multiples and we'll start out and go over homework four and then we'll come back and uh, talk about the steps we need to do to complete uh, the group project for next week. <clears throat> and there's also a couple exams coming up that you guys will need to complete by next week as well. So that is our, our plan for tonight. But before we dive into anything, I'll uh, just open the floor for any general questions about anything. Yeah, Professor, I had a quick question, um, and I know we're probably going to get into it and maybe address it for uh, for the group project. Mm -hmm. um, you know, going through the homework and everything, you saw you gave us a lot of information about the comparable companies. Yep. When it comes to the group project, uh, I know that you just gave us information about our own company. So as far as the, you know, um, all the other details with the comparable companies, is that something that we can have to research on our own or is that something that we can email you and you provide to us? I uh, just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, that's actually a really good point. Um, <clears throat> so what I'm probably going to do is when we get to the group project aspect tonight, um, I'll just say we'll identify who your peers are. I'll grab the data either tonight or tomorrow morning 
and I'll post it there for you because in order to do the analysis in a way that you did for the homework, I don't think you'll be able to individually get that data. And it'll be just much more efficient if I give it to you in that format. So uh, that's something that I'll need to do to help you guys. Uh, so I'll do that again. Good point. Either tonight or tomorrow. Uh, we'll, we'll add that to that folder for each of the meetings. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, thank you for pointing that out. Other questions before we get started? About anything? All right, so I went ahead while we're, we're thinking about that. Uh, in the files folder of Elms, uh, if you go to, I like closed out of it by mistake, but if you go to the files folder and you go to the uh, uh, homework for, uh, for the class, you should see that I just unhid the solution to homework four. So that file is now available. And I'm gonna pull it up here in just one second. So yeah, it's in files, homework four, and the file is called uh, multiples analysis dash hw8.xlsx. That will be the solution file to homework four for multiple analysis. So I am going to pull it up for Boeing, Lockheed Martin, and Raytheon at the time of the assignment. All right. So essentially, the key before we get into the, uh, the topic here that I wanted to mention is basically multiples are really just rearranged math from a cash flow valuation. Professor? And, yes. I'm sorry. Um, do, you, uh, do you mean to share your screen right now? Because we don't see your screen. Yeah, I'm about to. I'm, oh, okay. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm moving towards area, but thank you for letting me know. Okay. Uh, I was actually trying to get up the original uh, one other file first. Okay. <clears throat> So let me go ahead and share my desktop. Sorry about that. Jumped the gun a little bit. No, no, no. Hard to just listen to people talking. This is not a podcast. So, so basically, what I just wanted to mention, I'm going back to some of the material that was in the book and in the video. But basically, and I'll start this slide just good enough to mention this. This is a, a representation of the key value. And, and so just a high level summary of what we've been doing is a company basically, the difference between a company and a project is a company lasts forever. So when we value a company, we value it assuming that it's going to last forever. So in math, we call that a perpetuity. And so in this class, the approach that McKinsey has taken is they created what they call the key value driver equation, KVD for short, which is the rearranged growing perpetuity equation. And that is this formula right here on the screen. The no plat times the one minus the growth over the ROIC divided by the WAC minus the G. And, and so the idea is what we're really doing is we're just valuing a company by forecasting them forever. Now, the way we set up the valuation model is we're valuing the company forever, we're breaking it into two periods. So if you look at our valuations, so I'll just pull up uh, as an example, we're talking about yum. So essentially what we're doing, and you can see that in our valuation tab, is we're valuing the company for a period of time, year by year, until it just becomes too difficult to forecast year by year, reasonably but then we forecast this continuing value period, which is essentially the growing perpetuity equation. So <clears throat> there's usually two periods in a forecast. Now, in an ideal world, <clears throat> um, we could actually just skip the year by year forecast and just use the key value driver formula to forecast a company, right? And what you can see even in our model 
is the one challenge with continuing value, and if, even if you look at Yum here, is that you know typically 70 to 90 percent of the value of a company occurs after year six, or in some degrees after year eight, nine, or ten. So the real value is very sensitive to this growing perpetuity equation, and slight changes in this growing perpetuity equation can actually have huge impacts on the value of a firm. So in an ideal world, what you really want is you want your valuation to, when you use this perpetuity, for the company to be, to some degree, a mature company. So that way, you don't see any big changes in the growth rate, you don't see any big changes in the ROIC, you don't see any big changes in NOPLAT, so that the growing perpetuity is probably more representative. Using this formula works mathematically, but it's harder if you were to apply this to a company like a SNAP or an early stage company where we don't really know what their long-term growth is going to be. We don't know what their ROIC is going to be. We don't really know how profitable their margins are going to be. I mean, we do it, but again, slight changes in growth as you play around with the model have huge changes in the values for the firm. So, so the point of the story is we can actually use this formula to value the company. The reason we typically don't is just because when companies are at different stages of their biggest life cycle, you gotta represent the entire company down to four numbers. But that being said, we can do this. And that's the premise behind multiples. So multiples are just rearranged math. And the key to the rearranging of the math, and you can see this, the rearranging of the math here to get to the enterprise value to EBIT multiple, is, is the idea that we are kind of treating the company in perpetuity. And so in an ideal world, multiples work best for companies that are not in hyper growth mode, but nonetheless, they can work for any type of company. And because it's a rearranged math, it also allows us to triangulate. So again, what I hopefully I'm stressing, if nothing else, simplistically this semester is that, you know, a lot of people in the real world think of multiples as like something completely different than cash flow and valuation, when in the reality, it's not. And if you think about it, it's just a representation of a perpetuity. And the key to the perpetuity is growth and spread. And so multiples at the end of the day are just a representation of growth and spread. And so the key to a company is that when you think about where an, a company and industry are, so for example, I'm gonna pull up the one in Bloomberg right now. If I were to go to a company like a Lockheed Martin today, which is different than your assignment, which we're gonna come back to, and I were to look at peers for a company like a Lockheed Martin, which will have the companies that we did on our analysis here. And if I were to look at the multiples today for the company that we are using, one of the things I just want to point out is that top line, which is the industry average, the way to think about the industry average is that's the average growth and spread gets you that for the industry. So for example, an average growth and spread for the industry gets you 10.68 times EV to EBITDA. An average growth and spread in the industry is 1.9 times next year sales. Uh, any chance the kitchen person can put yourself on mute? Thank you. Please. Uh, the <clears throat> same thing for enterprise value to EBIT and to some degree PE. So the reason why a company will trade at what's called a premium or a higher value than the average is because they have some growth spread combination, some cash flow combination that should generate an amount higher than the industry average. The reason they should trade at a discount is that they should have a lower growth spread combination than the average of the industry. And I, I think I said in the video, but I like to say that some people also interpret multiples naively. Like for example, what they might say about this comp this uh, this um, multiple table is, if the average EV to EBITDA on this list is 10.68, and Raytheon is trading at 9.2, then people would say Raytheon is cheap. And technically, you could argue that, but more realistically, what it says is, Raytheon just doesn't have the growth and return expectation of its other peers. And because it has a little bit lower growth and spread, that's why it's trading at a little bit of a discount. So it's not cheap. It's just not going to create as much value in terms of the growth spread combination. So what makes Raytheon more attractive over time, if it's going to trade at the average, is it's not regression to the mean. It's they either need higher growth and or higher spread in order to get back to the average. And that's the other. So are you are you are you contending then if 
if that multiple was less than 9.2, essentially, it would at that point be cheap? Well, what I'm saying is that we now know through this assignment um, what the growth spread combination is. And, and the point is, if we had a realistic view for what a company, we'll use Raytheon as an example, if we had a realistic view for what the cash flows of Raytheon would be, a realistic ROI and a realistic growth, we should have a theoretical multiple Raytheon should trade at. So what makes Raytheon cheap is that they are trading less than their theoretical multiple. It doesn't make Raytheon cheap to say that they're trading less than their peers because they're trading less than their peers because the market's determined that they're not creating as much growth and spread as their peers. So there's two things here. There's the performance against expectation determines whether you're cheap or not. Performance against your peers is different. It's, it's basically how are you doing in the growth spread combination against your peers. And I just wanted to set this conversation up so as we go through the solution, hopefully it will help you better understand the analysis that you just did. So again, timing matters. So this was last year. So the, the date is a little different today, if we were to do it today, than it was at the time of the valuation. But we will start out with the price to earnings multiple. The key to the price to earnings multiple, or the PE, is number one, we're using the forward PE, which means, and again, just to mix apples and oranges, because I happen to have it on the screen, if I go to Lockheed Martin, because these are the screens that you're going to see in Bloomberg, <clears throat> this is the current year, okay, where it says act, whenever you see these screens on the earnings estimates. And where it says est, these are estimates, these are the forward years. So this is the first forward year, second forward year, third forward year. And so the, the point is 2019 for a lot of these companies is a blend of real data which goes through March and forecast data which goes through December. So it's a mix. So what the market typically does, and this is what the book mentions, is they tend to standardize when they do multiples around the second forward year. And the reason why primarily is because it's a clean year. Like 2020, the second forward year, is the first clean year, meaning it's all forecast, where 2019 is part forecast, part actual. So <clears throat> this is where the market tends to normalize the data around a forecast. And just theoretically, as you get further into the future, you actually tend to get more mature generally. So basically it means that the, the data is more representative of being normalized than today's data could necessarily be, especially if you're a growth company. But long story short, this is the data that we were using. So again, key value drivers. This is the key value driver equation. The only difference we do for a price to earnings multiple is that when we do free cash flow, we're doing the cash flow to the operating value, which means it's all the cash available to the debt and the equity holders. When you do a price to earnings multiple, you're actually just doing the cash flow to the equity holders. You're ignoring the debt. And because debt is treated as a cost. So essentially, all we did, and this is what's true in the real world PE, is we replaced no plat with net income, because that is the actual cash flow to the, net, to the equity holders. Instead of the growth in the cash flow, it's the growth in the net income. So therefore, growth in EPS. Instead of ROIC, the return on the invested capital, the return to the debt and the equity, it's the return just to the shareholders. <clears throat> and when we discount it, we discount it the cost of equity, not the WAC, because the WAC includes a cost of debt. And we're just looking at a clean equity valuation. But the, the point is, when you put it through key value drivers, this is called the market cap, or the market value of the company. And again, price divided by earnings is PE. So what you were trying to do in this exercise is essentially use the academic formula to basically figure out why the company trades at this PE using some market data. So I'm going to pause here and let somebody explain to me basically why at the time was Boeing trading at a premium to Lockheed Martin. So Professor. you need the data. Tell me why. Yes. Yeah. So um, uh, I really just had another point. Um, I'm looking at your expected 
a return on equity mm -hmm. that you have for Boeing and Lockheed. Yeah. And unless I'm looking at this wrong, I think you have the decimals in the wrong place. Because... No. Well, go, go ahead. Yeah, ask your question. Yeah, because for like Boeing, I'm looking at the EEO and like for like 2018, return on equity is 1.232. Yeah, that's 1,200%. Not 1%, that's actually 1,200% or 120%. Um, so what's, what's actually happened in the defense and aerospace industry, which has made these return in equities a little crazy, is these companies have been buying back a lot of stock. The, the payout rates in this industry are incredibly high. So what basically means is they're wiping out their equity by buying it back at market cap. So there's very little equity at Boeing and very little equity at Lockheed Martin. So it actually makes their return in equities pretty extreme. Is this, is this to a degree kind of snapshot as well, just given, given the fact that these contracts are kind of lumpy? I mean, do these, do these ROEs kind of swing as they... Well, they would if they were not... As they buying. sign large contracts or no? Well, they would. The short answer is they would if the ROE was more normalized and they weren't buying back all the stock. But the problem is this is the manipulation of the balance sheet that occurs when companies actually repurchase the shares. And, and in a way, this is why what I'm advocating to people in this room, these multiples are less telling about a company's real value than the enterprise value multiples because PE is much more sensitive to accounting manipulation than the enterprise value multiples. And that's one of the problems that you're actually seeing here in this analysis is that because they bought back all their stock, technically there's no equity. And with no equity or very little equity, you're seeing these extreme returns on equity, which are not representative of what these projects are actually earning or even the businesses are earning long-term. It's, it's representative because they bought back their stock and it's artificially inflating their returns. So you get a better understanding of a performance of a business with the enterprise value and EBIT and EBITDA multiples. That's why we're going to switch over to the other tab in a minute. But being said, we still got to explain the equity value. And so that's where we were basically trying to go through this. So again, back solving the growth that makes this work. So, but in this context, why is Boeing trading at a premium to Lockheed Martin? Just with the data that you see here. Why is this trading at almost 20 and this at 15? Looking at the data on the screen, what, why are people paying more for Boeing at the time than yeah. Lockheed? So, was, hold on. Okay. Uh, Christian, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say because you're essentially growing a higher expected net income uh, into perpetuity at 5.46% versus expected net income that's half that of Boeing at 2.62% for Lockheed Martin, which more than compensates for the 1.3% higher cost of equity that Boeing has relative to Lockheed Martin. Yeah, and, and by the way, just, and you can see this on the spreadsheet, the multiples are disconnected from the net income itself. Meaning if I make this a dollar, the multiple doesn't change. So the key to the multiples is, these are the key value drivers. That's the point about multiples. This is what drives your multiples. So the reason it's trading higher is what the first comment was. It's all about the growth rate. This growth rate is really why people are paying more for Boeing because if I grow a dollar of earnings at 5.5% a year versus 2.6% compounding, that leads to a lot more cash. And it, these are both positive spreads. So I'm basically getting more growth in the positive spread at Boeing, which is leading to more cash flow. Okay, because again, think about ROE as a proxy for cash flow. So continuing on, why is Raytheon trading at a discount to Lockheed Martin if Raytheon's growth rate is higher? Is it, is it related to a higher cost of equity? Partially, it's the cost of equity. So again, if I'm discounting at a higher rate, 
and you can see it here. You can even play it out in the model, 9.2. Then if I took the, the cost of equities to 9.2, then the multiple would actually be higher. So basically the multiple is lower because of the cost of equity. So that's the other thing. That's why I wanted to start the conversation by saying multiples are an expression of growth and spread, but there's a caveat here that we're still discounting the cash flows. And even if you have two companies that have identical spread, if the ultimate cost of capital, cost of equity, cost of whack is higher with the same spread, they'll still trade at a multiple, all things, lower multiple, all things be equal because you're discounting at a higher rate. So exactly right. Raytheon, even though they're growing much faster, and again, their ROE is not higher, but what's really kind of stifling a little bit of their multiple is the higher cost of equity, right? And, and that's exactly right. Like their growth rate would actually lead to more cash flow if they weren't discounting it as much. Okay. Now, by the way, you could have played with these. And if you put Boeing's return on equity to like 30%, you'll notice that the PE does go down, but it probably doesn't go down as much as you think it does. So when you get to a pretty high return on investment, 20, 30, 40% plus, what starts to matter more to your value is not increasing their ROI, but actually finding the growth opportunity because it's, it's the growing those big projects that become more valuable. Otherwise, you can think of a company that has a high return trading like a bond. So I can generate a lot of cash, but if I don't grow it and I can predict it out, then it's almost like a bond. And, and therefore the multiple is actually not gonna be so high. So what matters when you have the high rates of return is the growth. It's that growth and spread that really start to create a much higher level of multiple. So why don't we come over here to EV to EBIT and look a little deeper. So these are now EV to EBIT. Going back to our video, this is the key value driver rearranged. So again, no plat is EBIT times one minus the tax rate. Divide both sides by EBIT. We basically get one minus the tax rate times one minus the growth of our ROIC divided by WAC minus G. <coughs> That was what we were solving towards. And we wanted to match them up to basically figure out the G, but this G is not growth in EPS. This G is growth in free cash flow proxy no plat. And the same margin, sales. So why is Boeing trading at a premium to Lockheed Martin an enterprise value to EBIT? So looking at these numbers. Why is Boeing trading at a premium? And this is more representative of their contracts because ROIC doesn't care about your equity. Because remember, ROIC, as we're defining it, is going to basically be proxy working capital and PPD and acquisition premiums. So it's less concerned with capital structure, debt and equity, which is what PE is more impacted by. So when you take out the impact of capital structure, it's a cleaner view of your assets. So that ROIC is more of an operating ROIC. That's why we're using operating ROIC. I've got a question, Professor. Sure. Uh, for Boeing, where did you get that 36.6% uh, for return on investment capital? I believe in the assignment. Or Did I not give you an operating ROIC? No, because and that's why I was wondering because in a in a message you sent out, you said to use the uh, return on invested capital, so the seventy eight point four five percent. Yeah. So we can right. compare that to peers. Let me do it this way. It's not going to change the analysis all that much. Uh, the reason why I think I did it differently here is because I actually was using our model to do it, to actually back into an ROIC at the time. And uh, you didn't have that. So that would probably be the difference. Sorry about that. 
So let's put this growth rate. And then since we use that for Boeing, um, I just interpreted that we use the, the same for um, uh, Lockheed and Raytheon as well. Yes. Why do you look at the Yeah, so for well, let me look here. It was the operating ROIC is what I'd given you. Operating ROIC for Lockheed was 1067. So that's what I have here. And for Raytheon was the 15.8. Okay. I, I just assume since we, since we didn't have the operating ROIC for Boeing, then we use the regular. Yeah, I told you to use the 7845 as a proxy. Somebody had actually asked me that question. It's not gonna change your analysis because again, you'll see the growth is still higher. But let's go with this. So somebody still walked through. Why is Boeing trading at a premium to Lockheed Martin using EV to EBIT? And again, you're looking at these numbers right here. They're much more productive than both Lockheed and Raytheon. So using those four numbers, when you say much more productive, which number are you focusing on? Uh, the ret return on invested capital. Yeah. They so here, more. so let's, let's just point out, here two things are happening. The growth rates between, at the time, Boeing and Lockheed Martin on their operations, they're operating their, basically their EBIT, were much closer than the growth rate for EPS, which is really what was here. So when you take out the capital structure, when the project returns, a little bit better at Boeing, but basically we're growing at similar rates of Lockheed, that project return at similar growth made them more valuable. But here's what I was also hinting at earlier. Look at this. If Boeing had the same cost of capital, same risk as Lockheed Martin, Watch what happens to that multiple. So even though they have a high spread, Boeing has an amazing spread using either number, the number I had in there or this number, one of the best spreads in the industry, up until recently with the 737 problems, they were very productive and very profitable. The one thing that was to some degree tempering their valuation was the much higher cost of capital. And again, if you think about cost of capital, it's cap M, and what's driving that is their higher beta, and what's driving their higher beta is the fact that Boeing is in more commercial businesses, which are more sensitive to a business cycle to some degree than the long-term government contracting work. So the markets were picking that up, they're putting in the higher whack for Boeing, and even though their returns were higher and their multiples higher, the higher whack to some degree tempered how high this multiple could be. So nonetheless, in, if, and this is subtle, but Boeing traded a premium, you could have just said because slightly higher growth and a lot higher spread. That's an absolute right answer. But what's interesting, and this is what I wanted to show you here in the video tonight, is how the extra cost of capital, even with this high spread, does have a discounting effect. So there's two things that are work at multiples. One is the spread, two is the absolute level of cost of capital. And when you have higher levels of cost of capital, it hurts you. And if you really want to see that, look at Lockheed Martin and Raytheon. Why is Raytheon trading at a discount to Lockheed Martin in the EV to EBIT multiple? What do you guys see here? Well, two reasons really. One, I mean, they shouldn't be because they do have a higher spread, but it's getting dragged down because uh, they have a higher whack and a higher tax rate. Exactly. So that was the, the third element that we hadn't talked about yet, but taxes do apply here because EBIT's pre-tax, and you're gonna have to take a portion of that and pay that out to the government, which is not gonna be available to the stakeholders. So in this case, it's two things, the higher discounting and the higher tax rate. So again, you can do the what if, 
if they had the same cost of capital, <clears throat> they'd be much closer, but they're still not with the higher spread <clears throat> because they don't have the growth and they have the lower tax rate. Okay? If they actually had the same tax rate, they would actually have a premium, but then still the growth of the higher spread, the growth of the spread is more valuable than the higher spread. So the extra growth would still be benefiting Lockheed Martin. So two things are, are sort of impacting Raytheon's multiple, right? One is the lack of growth and two is the higher tax rate. And those are two things that are tempering its multiple, even though it has a higher spread than Lockheed Martin. Okay. The other thing that people tend to focus on in multiples is margin. And again, going back to the video, what I was trying to show you in the video is that enterprise about this formula, enterprise value to EBIT, basically, uh, when you do the rearranging of the math, the key value driver formula, this is the rearranging of the math that gets you to the enterprise value to sales ratio, or enterprise value to EBIT ratio. And by the way, this enterprise value to sales is margin times all of this, and all of this is enterprise value to EBIT. Therefore, operating margin is enterprise value to sales divided by enterprise value to EBIT. So that's what you basically did here. So what you did is if you knew the enterprise value to sales and you knew the enterprise value to EBIT, this is the EBIT or operating margin of the firm into perpetuity. It's just math. So basically what we can also see is Raytheon is expected to have the highest profitability of the three companies long-term. <clears throat> 16.8% versus 13 and a half at Lockheed and 13 at Boeing. But what I also wanted to illustrate to you beyond the fact that it has high margin, higher margin doesn't always mean more value because that's sort of a leader's bias. Many leaders are like, okay, I'm just going to drive EPS and I'm just going to try and make a higher margin. So if I can grow my sales, grow my EPS and grow my margin, I become the most valuable company in the industry. That's not happening at Raytheon. They actually have the highest margin, but they're trailing in their multiples. Why? That's where this comes in. This is pre-tax margin. This is the after-tax margin. Okay? And so again, Profit over sales times sales over investment is profit over investment. If I take the reciprocal of that, sales over investment, reciprocal investment divided by sales, that's these three numbers. What does 0.87 mean? Uh, I think it means that it takes, it's just a kind of guess, I think it means that it takes uh, uh, 87 cents to create a dollar of sales. Is that what it is of investment? Exactly right. Okay. So, uh, so, so here's the point. There's two parts to return an investment. One is your margin, but the other is your productivity or efficiency, or basically how much you have to invest to get those sales and margins. These two things mathematically have equal weight because they are the drivers of ROIC. So that's what I kind of did here. What you did in the assignment is if we look at what the market's expected ROIC is, and we know what the margin is, this times this equals that, we back solve for this. So that's what the productivity tells us. So let me go a different way. Why does Boeing have the highest ROIC in the industry if they have the lowest margin in the industry? They make the lowest amount when they sell their plane as a percentage of sales. They only make 12.87 cents per dollar. But how do they turn that into a 78% ROI?
because of the productivity. What? Yeah, the 14. Tell me what the 14 means one more time. So it costs them 14 cents to get a dollar in sales. So essentially you're spending less to make that same dollar as compared to Raytheon or, well, in, in Lockheed, it, it's, they're losing money there. Um, so essentially they're, they're saving more um, for, for each dollar sales, which means they can pocket it, which means they have a higher return. Exactly. You, you couldn't have said it any better. And, and so two things become apparent here is that number one, people often overlook the impact of productivity because it goes back to free cash flow. The whole point of free cash flow is it's profit after reinvestment. And if I can reinvest less, because I'm just better at what I do, I'm more efficient, and I'm not cutting corners, then that can actually turn into a much better free cash flow from a lower profit. And that's basically what Boeing is, is Boeing is just very efficient at what they do. And as a result, they're using a whole lot less capital than Lockheed or Raytheon to sell their planes. And that has taken the low margin and made it more attractive. So if you really think about it, another reason why Boeing is trading at a premium is because of the productivity. I would actually argue that's another secret to their success because it's the driver behind their ROIC. It's not because they make more on their planes. It's because they're more efficient in their manufacturing process. They have less working capital and they have less PP&E to drive a dollar of sales. And it's by a factor of five. And that is really Boeing's source of advantage, historically. And that's what's driven their ROIC. So that's the point. If I can drive that ROIC and I can drive that growth, I'm trading at a premium. And that's what's given them sort of best in class for a long period of time until the tragedy of the 737 max. So I'm, I, we're going through a lot very quickly. So I'm just gonna pause here to ask the questions. I have a question about the um, productivity. So how is that possible that you have three manufacturers that have such different um, CapEx expenses? Is it, could it be that differences in their supply chain, like Boeing is outsourcing production, more production, so it has less capital expenditures? Uh, that, that's a good question. So, so I think you're, you're bringing up two options. So option one is they could be doing some outsourcing. So I'll use an example in another business, Apple. One of the reasons why Apple has been historically so successful is Apple doesn't actually make their phones. Apple outsources their phones to Foxconn. So basically, Foxconn sells Apple an iPhone for about $300, and then Apple turns around and sells it to you and me for 1000 and Foxconn takes all the risks. They hire the people. They, they have the factories. They have the inventory. So Apple, even though they're a $200 billion company, has very little in manufacturing. It's worked very well for them. And, and so they get tremendous productivity because they get somebody else to spend the money. So outsourcing is one way to do it. The second way to do that is, is you're just better. You're Toyota. You have just a much more efficient manufacturing and production system. And therefore, since I'm much more efficient, I can get my manufacturing product done better. I can do it with less inventory. I can do build to order and custom configure things where if you want to custom configure, you have to have a lot on your assembly line. There's a historical example I'm, I'm familiar with, and some people in this room might be manufacturers, you can help add to this, but one of the reasons why was we were looking at, at Toyota versus BMW is, for example, BMW, or sorry, Toyota, when you're going down the manufacturing line, if there's a defect on the manufacturing line, a worker pulls the cord, and then they fix the car right there, whole line shuts down, and the car is fixed. But more importantly, they don't just fix the car, they fix the process so that when the line starts up, all the cars that follow have that. BMW does it differently. BMW actually has a parking lot at the end of their manufacturing line. So when a, a car has a defect, they just let it go through. And at the end of the line, there's a team that goes in and it fixes the defects on all the cars that have the defects. I was talking to a Toyota engineer and he said, 
at any one time at the end of our line, there, there were like three or four cars that couldn't be fixed. Like that was it. Like everything else was fixed in place on the line. Whereas BMW had parking lots of hundreds of cars where you had to go back and the, and the engineers had to go back and try and figure out individually what everything is wrong. And, and I want to represent as a metaphor. So there's two ways that you get better productivity. One is you're just better. And two is you're smarter. But it could be a combination of the two. Boeing is better. And, and one of the things Boeing has is that they build one thing over and over and over again. Lockheed Martin and Raytheon, they're project-based companies, generally. Uh, so as a result, they do a lot of different things. And they don't get the economy of scale of a Boeing. But an excellent point. Anybody here working for a manufacturing company that could bring in an example? Professor? Yes. Yeah, I, I actually work for Fiat Chrysler, and I can attest to the fact that um, a lot of the other OEMs, at least uh, locally in NAFTA, do operate the same way as BMW, where everybody more or less sends off to a parking lot or to a quote-unquote repair lot all of their vehicles, and yep. then, um, then have the opportunity to then go in and try to troubleshoot. And that's this, that's one of the strategies that at least that I know of internally that we're trying to go more towards the Toyota route. Unfortunately, right now it's a matter of volume. So yeah. everybody is we we're concentrating on producing a volume number of vehicles. And I think uh, that I think what Toyota has the advantage in is that because they are able to still produce a massive number mass number of volume. And at the same time, still correct those issues as they happen relatively quickly. That's where their real co true competitive advantage comes into play because they're able to troubleshoot and take care of those issues, yep. you know, very, very quickly. Whereas most of the other OEMs are still struggling to catch up. Well, and I like the word that you use because I actually agree with it, which is competitive advantage. Like if, if you really can get much more efficient use of your capital, again, without compromising quality or safety on a repeatable basis, you don't have to have the lowest margin to win. Um, you can actually, with similar margins, just churn it out at a much more efficient rate and, and actually get better financial performance over a longer period of time. So again, I know it goes beyond the scope of this class, but I'm doing a lot of work right now on what's called strategic agility. And, and what we're starting to find is that margins are getting much more standardized across firms. It's just harder and harder to get margin advantages that productivity is becoming more of the differentiator, particularly when you look at return on investment. And if you can have that productivity, you know, as you said, scaling up at Fiat Chrysler, if, if I can't scale up as fast as my peers, then I just have to throw more resources at it. It takes me longer to do it and I got to go fix it. That's just more costly. And, and over time, it has a big drag on my cash flow. And, and so again, a lot of companies are starting to look at productivity as driving. That's why lean has become so important. That's why Six Sigma, you know, which was the godfather of lean. Now you're starting to see scrum. I'm sure somebody in this call is probably working on a scrum team somewhere, but scrum is all about productivity. And that's the whole idea in the people side of the business on the same type of thing. But regardless, financially, what you can do, and this is the key to multiples, is you can kind of tease out from the multiples, at least what the market expects your productivity to be. So I'm not saying it's going to be this way going forward, but the way they're pricing it, this is kind of what the market views the ROIC, this is what the market kind of views the margin, and therefore this is what the market believes the productivity has to be in order to generate that return. And again, it's not that the market's always right, but nonetheless, that's how they're pricing these companies. And that's what's gonna drive the multiples and the values. And that's kind of what you were doing in this exercise. All right, other questions, comments? Appreciate the examples you guys shared. I had a question. Yes. Uh, in this example, for the PE multiple and the EV, the EBIT multiple, mm -hmm. Boeing is always trading at a premium to Lockheed Martin and Lockheed Martin is a premium to Raytheon. Yep. In the video you provided us with Procter and & Gamble and Clorox and Estee Lauder, that wasn't necessarily the case. Correct. So I, I guess, is there something that that's telling us or is it just how the cards play? I think it's more, it's, it's, it's a combination of, I would say, how the cards play 
And also different industries can have different kind of business models and different structures. So um, with that in mind, let's just kind of riff here and try and do a different one real quick. So uh, you, you're, in, you're in the automobile industry. So let me just look at Fiat Chrysler, somebody on the calls on Fiat. Oh, here's Fiat Chrysler. And hold on, I'm just gonna see if they have any crazy multiples going on here. Because <laughs> the automobile industry, sometimes weird things happen because they all lose so much money. <clears throat> okay, I don't, ooh, those PEs are awful. <laughs> you could buy Fiat Chrysler for 4.4 times next year's earnings. Pretty much it's, it's in the bargain bin. All right, so let's see. Let's, why is Fiat Chrysler and a couple of their peers trading what they are? Let's look at Fiat, BMW, and Daimler. Okay, so file save. And by the way, think of this as auto. Um, I'll save this as auto. This is what you're gonna have to do for next week. So we'll practice for your multiple assignment. So we got Fiat, we got BMW, and we have a Daimler, which is Mercedes-Benz. So again, uh, first we'll look at PEs. Right now, uh, Fiat is 4.45. So that's the observed PE, if you're doing this, 4.45. Uh, BMW is 7.02 and Daimler 7.13. 7.02, 7.13. Okay, next, EEO. So if we were doing the PEs for these companies, first thing we would do is second forward year. So one, two, right? And it doesn't matter because we're gonna do ratios, these are in euros, but for Fiat Chrysler, net income, 48.22, we use adjusted net income in the second forward year. So 48.22. Expected return in equity for the next three years, 17, 16, 16. I'm just gonna round off for interest of time and say somewhere around 16, 16 and a half. I'll give them a benefit of the doubt. I'm swagging that. And as a cost of equity, today, 7.7%, or sorry, 12.2% is the cost of equity. So if we were trying to back solve for this growth rate, obviously, watch what happens when I make it slower. So here's the thing. This is a good example of a challenge. Why do you think this PE is so low for Fiat Chrysler? And I'll give you a hint. Look at these return and equities. What does it mean to have a negative growth rate here? The slowdown. Yeah, if you have a negative growth into perpetuity, what is that basically telling you? Not just slowdown. Losses in income. Yeah, it means you peaked. A negative growth into perpetuity means the future is actually worse. You're gonna have less earnings in the future than you are today. My guess is when the market is looking at this trend in return equity, they're not just looking at the next three years, it's continuing to go down. And by the way, when you get down to 11.7 and you grow it, matter of fact, it's probably gonna be something more like this. Uh, 
percent, uh, like eight <clears> percent. <throat> Why? There we go. This is probably more realistic. So we have to play around with a little bit more. So I'm in trouble with my Max computer here. But uh, if I had to guess what the market's really expecting, given this cost of equity, is growing the negative spread. They're pricing them as if they're growing a negative spread. Get the close here. By the way, BMW. <clears throat> just to put that into perspective. Uh, Germany, so 10 to 11 is pretty consistent. So we'll call this 10 and 11, no, we'll call it 11. <clears throat> Their um, net income in 2020 in euros is 6801. And their cost of equity is 10.9%. So again, same thing with BMW. If I were to look at growth rates, I'm guessing that this spread, probably if they're growing at, I don't know, three, 4% a year, starts to be negative. So whether it's, you know, eight, something like that. This is how they're priced. So what's interesting, and this is a little bit tougher analysis, is that the next few years are decent, but then it gets really bad after you go through the next few years, the way that they're actually being priced today. They're being priced as if they're gonna do much worse in the future than they are today. And Daimler, by the way, we're just trying to do them. This is going to be a little bit more difficult because of the actual multiples. Uh, 12, 11 and a half to 10, and 11, 9, 4, 5. 11, 9, 4, 5. And I'm going to call this 10 for now. But here's the same problem as a cost of equity 12, 2. And any reasonable growth rate, like I said, all three of these firms are being priced not in how they're doing in the next three years, they're being priced long-term to have negative spreads. Because if I were to put in how they're expected to do in the next three years, then they should be doing much better in the stock market than they are today, particularly for Fiat and BMW. So what you're actually seeing in the real world, that's where I said the the insight from doing this analysis can kind of be telling is here's an example of a company that's either a undervalued because the market is mispricing them and they should actually be fiat should stock price should be about 70% higher than it is today or B fiat is being priced as if the worst is yet to come and it hasn't been, hasn't hit them yet. And if I had to guess, I think the market is just fearful because we know two things are happening in auto. We hit peak auto in 2015. We know that there's a transition, which is very expensive to sell driving cars. And we're moving towards the sharing economy. And I'm not sure the traditional manufacturers are gonna win in that marketplace. And I think that's where people are, are expecting this kind of negative growth in the future by some of the automobile makers. So if all those assumptions are wrong, now's a really good time to buy Fiat and BMW because basically, if they keep doing what they're doing the next few years, then they're underpriced. This would be an example of an underpriced firm. So there's a big dichotomy between where they are today and where the market is pricing them today. So the market is forward forecasting, worst performance. And that's what I'm saying. You can see that using the academic formulas, it, it pretty much has to be negative spreads. <clears throat> that's where the market fears is gonna happen to the automobile industry. And again, I'm doing this really quickly. Questions? Yeah, I have a question. Um, how do you measure productivity in a service company? I mean, do they necessarily put operating invested capital on their balance sheet, or how do you value human capital, and how does that impact your ROIC? 
Um, that's a good question. So generally, uh, with a few exceptions, you can't capitalize labor. So <clears throat> I've seen some companies try to capitalize labor. I was working with Eli Lilly a number of years ago, and they actually attempted to capitalize their R&D. Now, they did this internally. This wasn't Gap. This was internally. And they, they estimated basically how long it took to bring a drug through development, and they basically treated their R&D people expenditures just like they were building a building and amortized it over that period of time. And so they actually put it on an internal balance sheet, changed their margins. And that was pretty extreme. But the, the short answer to the story goes back to my work that I've done historically with Lockheed Martin. <laughs> Is that, and I, did we talk about Lockheed Martin in the last couple of weeks here? Not, not really. I, I, don't, I don't want to repeat the story if I've told you guys this before. Uh, cause I might've told this to the undergrad section cause I, I know we were talking about Lockheed, but so for example, um, one of the things that Lockheed Martin did historically <clears throat> is that when they realized they had a hundred thousand engineers that you're paying a hundred thousand dollars a year plus, well, think about it this way. If you, you assume there's 2000 hours in a year and you divide that into a hundred thousand dollars, that works out to be about $50 an hour. And realistically, when you throw in overhead rates, their real cost is probably closer to like 80 to $100 an hour. But the, the point of the story is, let's say it's $100 an hour. So if I'm basically paying you $100 to do something, then every hour that I'm putting into a project that is unbilled is essentially inventory. And so what you'll see for service businesses, particularly longer term project service businesses, is you'll see sort of a, a work in process or an unbilled, uh, unbilled amount, which will essentially be on the balance sheet, and it's no different than inventory. And the same actually applies, which is if I can invoice for what I do every two weeks versus every six weeks because I can hit a milestone, then that reduces my investment and therefore my invested capital because I'm actually collecting the cash faster and I don't have to tie up that money before I get paid. So again, one of the reasons why Lockheed Martin historically has done well in the industry is because the cycle time that they turn over their cash is much lower. And so what that's called is days of invested capital. So I will go back to the defense and aerospace industry and I will go to RV. So this is 2018 results, and I will give it to you in terms of a custom cycle time. But basically this represents cycle time in days, and I'll go from fastest to slowest for the defense and aerospace industry in 2018. And you'll see that the average cycle time is 151 days last year. Lockheed Martin was 74. <clears throat> so what that means is if you look at the invested capital, <clears throat> Lockheed Martin on average last year tied up essentially $11 billion of capital for 74 days, cash to cash. That's how long on average it took them to turn a dollar of this investment, mostly through the people and projects and they call them programs in the industry, and then generate an invoice and get paid by a customer. If I do the same thing at, let's go with a company you've heard of before, General Dynamics, General Dynamics is tying up $28 billion and the average project billing time for General Dynamics is 284 days. Uh, Raytheon is 178 days. Uh, who are some of these other companies? Boeing is still pretty fast at 77 days. But basically, this is what you're talking about. And this is the cash to cash cycle. So whether you're manufacturing, L3 is another slow company at 281 days. Uh, Parker Hannafin, which is a part manufacturer, to the uh, mostly the airline industry, 
uh, again, relatively slow, that's where the competitive advantage shows up and that's where the time shows up for service businesses. So that's way, only until it becomes a, a unbilled residual flow at that point, right? Yeah, and by the way, that's no different than if I went to back to the automobile industry and I swapped this out for Fiat Chrysler. and looked at the cycle time in the automobile industry. So it's the same idea if I'm manufacturing a car versus I'm a project team that's building a, an IT project or some other type of project, then the cycle time in the manufacturing to manufacture autos last year was 264 days. So the average automobile manufacturer from spending a dollar, going through their, their plants, raw materials, inventory, you know, the working process to finish goods, to sitting on a lot, to invoicing and getting paid, 264 days. Fiat Chrysler, relative to these peers, the European peers, relatively fast, 102. Peugeot, really fast, 15. <clears throat> if I switch this to global, and Here's the global peers for cycle time. But <clears throat> getting a, a little bit of a field here in the comments, but the, the point of the story that I'm trying to get to is this becomes a key driver of cash flow and ROIC because the idea is if it takes you longer to do things with the same resources, then you're tying up more free cash flow and you're going to have a lower return investment and therefore be less valuable for the same amount of investment. Average cycle time in the industry, 149. Let's see who's really fast. Or here's real, who's really slow. Nissan's really slow. Renault's really slow. Ferrari's really slow. Makes sense. Hyundai, not so fast. Ford, incredibly slow in the industry. All right. So back to our content for tonight. So as we're getting closer to the end of the class, that was kind of homework four. And what's coming up for next week is the actual group project assignment. So two things related to your group projects. So one, somebody mentioned at the end, beginning of the class that I'm going to give you the other couple peers uh, tonight or tomorrow to help you do essentially this type of analysis on your peers. And next week when we do our presentations, you're going to have to turn in a document and explain this and i just want to be very clear about what i'm looking for next week in your presentations so <clears throat> let's go ahead and cover that so for your four companies close out of this Files. CVS, Halliburton, Nike, Royal Caribbean. First question, were, was everybody able to put their data into these files and without trouble in terms of doing your evaluations? Did everybody try to do that yet? Yes. Yeah. Any trouble? Anybody have any trouble with that? Okay, great. So, I uh, mind that. All right. So basically, with your data, you're going to do four things in a PowerPoint. And what I'm going to ask you to do is to make sure that your supporting data is in your PowerPoint file. So that way, you'll you'll be able to reference your data as you go through the presentation. And for this semester, I am simplifying it so that you don't have to simultaneously write a paper. So that's good news, bad news for you. The good news is you don't have to write a paper. The bad news is it means the importance of your PowerPoint and the presentation you give next week is that much more. So don't screw up your presentations next week because that's how you're gonna be graded. There is no fallback paper to help you. So let's be very clear about what I'm looking for next week. First, section, 
for each of your companies, you're gonna do the EIC. So I'll pick on CVS here, which means E, you're gonna talk about the economic sensitivity of your company. So you're gonna start out a conversation about what's, what you believe is happening with the economy and the economic sensitivity of your company and your industry based on what you see happening to the economy. So I'm not gonna answer it for CVS, but I'll tell you that you're gonna be talking about this slide, you're gonna be looking at your raw beta, you're gonna be talking about your market cap weighted average, and then you're gonna be talking about your individual company related to that industry, okay? Now, that's the E. For the I, the next thing you're gonna do, I'm gonna close this is you're gonna bring up this file and you're gonna use this to talk about the I and the C. Here's where you decide whether or not this is an attractive industry and here's where you decide whether or not your company is generating competitive advantage. And oh, by the way, here is where you can also supplement it with real world information. So for example, if you happen to be reading the Wall Street Journal in the last couple of days, uh, they've talked about the poor performance of CVS and Walgreens, I don't know if it's still on the front page, and the problems they're having with prescription drugs. So I don't know where they moved it to, but basically if you look in their recent earnings, Walgreens got hammered because they basically talked about lowering guidance for prescription drugs. And as a result, CVS also got hammered uh, because of that. So happen to notice some things like that, talk about that in your industry. Second, once you've talked about the spread for the I, you then need to do a five forces. You need to summarize the five forces today that explain that spread. And you need to talk about why those five forces could change and what that would infer the direction of the spread in five years. So translation, this industry's got about a one point spread right now. Is it gonna have a one point spread in five years? Is it gonna get bigger, stay about the same, go negative? That's how you're communicating that by talking about in terms of the five forces. And then competitive advantage, you're gonna make an assessment about CVS's spread today, which suggests whether or not it has competitive advantage and whether that's gonna change in five years based on what you know the company is doing. So that part, is combination quantitative, using the numbers, qualitative, view of the future, which should be research-based. That's where the BICO information can help you and feel free to, to use other sources of information. Another good source of information, if you haven't used it, is in the VBIC homepage. There is, off of uh, in Elms, under industry, there's a database called IBIS World. If you haven't used it, go to IBIS World, has industry research reports. Basically, they write professional five forces analysis for industries. Again, you're welcome to use it. Just cite, don't plagiarize. So I'm gonna pause I'm not, here. I'm not familiar with that site. Would you mind sending out a hyperlink in an announcement? Yeah, so the short answer, short answer is, the way you get to it, you're gonna, you're gonna log in yourself, is off of what's called the VBIC homepage. It's off of Elms, right here. Oh, okay. And you open a new tab, it's gonna make you log in. So I can't give you the link, it'll make you log in. Uh, but it goes to the, it's basically Maryland's online uh, library site. And once you get here, these are their online industry data sources. So free to you as a student. Uh, one of them, by the way, is Hoover's, another site you can use to supplement the information. But when you go to IBIS World, you can type in a company, so Nike, as an example, and it'll tell you these are the industry research reports that Nike is in. So for example, if you go to athletic and sporty goods manufacturing in the US, <clears throat> then this is the industry report. You can click on it and it'll download a PDF if you want, or they have all these tabs for the industry. So industry outlook, which is the five forces, size of the industry, competitive summary. And one of the things that's kind of interesting is key stats, because here they'll show, for example, industry growth rates going into the future. So you can see that the shoe business is expected to grow between 
one to two percent for the next five or six years globally. I so, love I love how it took my until my last semester for someone to show me that this existed. <laughs> well, regardless, I'm letting you know it's there now. It's there's also the bike awesome. information. Thank you. <laughs> so this is called IBIS. It's off of VBIC. And again, something that's a resource to you as a Smith student. So, but the point is, and, and again, you got about 15 minutes. And, and unfortunately, because we have four teams in an hour and 30 minutes, I'm gonna have to hold you close to 15 minutes each. Is that basically, you know, assuming a quarter for each section, you got about four, call it four minutes to basically go over that material. And to basically help me understand what's going on in the industry and using some of the, the principles of this class, Sensitivity to the company, whether or not it's an attractive spread, why you believe it's a sp the spread is what it is, and whether or not using five forces and competitive advantage, that spread's going to change over time. That's what I'm looking for you to talk about in the EIC section. I'm going to pause. Questions about that? All right, section two. Section two follows homework two. You're gonna basically do historical analysis. So what is the historical analysis? Basically, if you go back to your model, in your model, there are two tabs. One tab is called ROIC drivers. This is the ROIC tree. So in section two, you're gonna show me the tree, you're gonna walk through it. And, and for focusing on the highlights of what's changing ROIC for your company, primarily between the first and the last year, but if anything interesting in the middle happens, you might want to mention it too. I'll call it two levels. Tax rate, margin, productivity, drivers of the income statement, drivers of the balance sheet. Use numbers, whoever's presenting on your team when you go through that. Number two, historical CFI. You're talking about the history, so you just take the forecast, right click, hide, and basically walk through the historical CFI. You're talking about the four sections. If free cash flow, what was the reinvestment rate? What did they do with depreciation relative to the investment? What happened to get to CFI with non-operating, usually changing cash? And what did they do with their debt and equity? That's section two. Again, approximately four minutes. Do you want that to be totaled over the five years? Ideally, yes. So simplistically, total equals sum copy paste done etc that would be helpful for you guys as well section three multiples it's kind of what we went over tonight it's in, in the homework i want you to do the multiples i'll give you two peers for your peers so for like example, for Nike, I'll probably give you like Puma and Adidas or something like that. And just as we went through tonight, what I want you to do for both of the pages in the multiple analysis is basically to explain, again, your company, why is it trading at a premium or discount and use these drivers? Your company, why is it trading at a premium and discount using these drivers? What does it say about the margin and productivity? basically what we walk through tonight in general. That's section three, again, about four minutes. And finally, section four is your valuations. You're gonna do, just as you did for the homework tonight, or last week, you're gonna do four valuations. You're gonna do an as is, you're gonna do a bull, a bear, and a target. You're gonna have four, essentially, Excel mile, models. What I really care about as you go through the bull, the bear, and the target, is if you go back to the valuation model, the key drivers are growth rate, EBITDA margin, tax rate, and to some degree, G. And if you change it, whack, but I doubt you'll be changing the whack. So basically, as you walk through those models, what did you change about those? four or five variables. So what did you change and why to get to the bull? What did you change about growth, margin, tax rate to get to the bear and why? And where did you change to get to your target, which is what you think the company should be worth in the next 12 months? Based on that, it should create a buy-sell hold. 
<clears throat> plus or minus 10% is a hold. M more than 10% is a buy. Less than 10% is a sell. And so that should get you your buy sell hold rating. And so basically those are the four sections. That final section again, about four minutes. Um, I will then probably ask you a couple of questions. So for example, if you are doing CBS, I'm just telling you, I was reading the Wall Street Journal yesterday. Uh, they got hammered along with Walgreens because of what happened with prescription drugs. So you should at least pay attention to topically what's happening with your company. You know, if you're doing Nike, I'll probably ask you about the Zion Williamson shoe explosion and whether that has, you know, affected Nike stock price going forward or if that's going to be a big deal. So uh, again, just you know, pay attention to what's going on in the headlines because obviously these are real world companies and to some degree that will be influencing some of the things going on with their valuations. So go through that math, go, sorry, go through the four sections. I'll ask a couple of questions and that will basically be what we're covering next week. Uh, I'll leave it up to your teams on how you want to present. So we are gonna be using Zoom and I'm gonna do a quick test. So, can we take, does somebody have something on your desktop that you're not afraid to share? <laughs> so you're not watching anything you shouldn't be while we're talking in this class. If, if I gave somebody, all right, Danilo, if you look along the bottom, there's a yep. button that says share. Click on share. Uh, which screen, let's see. It's, it's in the bottom menu bar of Zoom. Yep, I see it. Click on share, and then you can either share your desktop or share a window. Boom. There we go. Now, I would assume that everybody can see this. Yes. Yeah, we can see it. So this is exactly how we're going to do it. So what will happen is, and thank you for doing that. You can stop your share now. Okay. So what we're going to do is each of the team members will pick whoever the representative is. You'll have your PowerPoint and any other, the supplemental information, I'd strongly recommend putting everything you wanna do in the PowerPoint. It'll get very difficult for us to follow you if you're jumping across multiple files. So put it all into that PowerPoint, and I need you to submit the PowerPoint before the session, so as a team, so you'll submit it as a team, but you can decide whether one or more members would go through it. In the interest of the MBA program, I would hope that more than one of you is going through it. In an ideal world, you have a different person for each section, but nonetheless, you're getting a group grade for this project. So whether you're presenting or not, you're gonna get the same grade, and I would expect that everyone in this, in this class is helping in putting together that PowerPoint presentation and the valuation analysis, whether you're presenting or not. But I'll leave it to your teams and how you wanna present next week. But that's gonna be the final big part of your grade, so this is, this is an important project for the teams. So let me pause there to see if there's additional questions about that project. All right, two last things as we wrap up tonight. Number one, there's also an exam. It was called the midterm exam, but we're kind of at the end of the semester. So it's kind of like the midterm final divided by two. So there's two pieces to it. If you go to Elms, if you haven't already, and if you go to Files, let me start sharing my screen again. <clears throat> I'm sorry, Assignments. It's called Midterm 1 and Midterm 2. Both are due before the start of next week's class. Right? Each are worth 10, 10 points or 10% 10 of your grade for the semester. Midterm one is an economic statement conversion. So it's, it's literally just like the conversion homework that you did that you probably hated. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna click on that. You'll have up to four hours from the time you click on it. So don't click on it until you're ready to do it. But you'll have up to four hours once you click on it. It'll give you an Excel file. You'll convert and upload the Excel file. Remember. This is open notes, so you can actually use the solution that I posted for the, uh, the homework assignment and what we talked about in the video to help you do midterm one. So it's just a straight conversion. 
the four statements, TII, TFI, CFI, economic profit. Midterm two, I think it's six or seven essay questions. I think it's six essay questions, but they're just essay questions. Short answer essays that basically cover the conceptual content that we've covered in class mostly and in the videos and in the readings for the semester. Again, it's open book, open notes, but nonetheless, you'll need to answer those essay questions and those two midterms are due before next Tuesday. So going into next Tuesday, complete the two midterms individually, work with your group on a single big PowerPoint file and presentation, put all the data into that PowerPoint file, including screenshots and screenshots of your Excel files, have your four models ready just in case, and then you'll give that 15 minute presentation, that's 40% of your grade, and we'll have it all wrapped up very shortly after next week's class. So that will end up completing us for the semester. Quick question, Professor. Yes, sir. So you got the timer for, for each one. Is it four hours for each section of the midterm or is it four hours total? No, it's four hours for each section. And the timer doesn't start until you start clicking on it. So basically, if I were to go to, I'll go to I'm not gonna click on this one because you'll actually see the essay questions if I preview it because I'm the instructor. But if I go to assignments and if I go to midterm part one, this one I can preview because it's just gonna show you the downloadable file. Uh, what it'll say is if you look here, started at 10.08 p.m. So basically there's a four hour clock and on your version it'll show you a clock, there it is over here on the right. So I now have three hours, 59 minutes and 42 seconds to submit. So it's four hours for midterm one and four additional hours for midterm two and the clock does not start until you actually start the exam. But I will just warn you, if you start the exam, you can't stop the exam. So even if I were to close out of the screen, that clock is still running in the background of the server, server. At the end of four hours, if there's nothing submitted, you're gonna get a zero. So don't click on it until you're ready to do it. And I'm just, four hours is not representative of how much time I, I think you're gonna take. I just gave you four hours because I recognize that you guys are not in a physical classroom. And if you're doing it you know, at home or at the office, I wanted to be generous with the time constraints of something were to pop up. I realistically think it should take about an hour to an hour and a half to do each one. But nonetheless, you have up to four hours to do. Just a quick question. So the, the midterm it's due on, you, you mentioned just earlier on Tuesday, but is it Wednesday actually? Sorry. Today, Wednesday. Yes, sorry, Wednesday. I've lost track of time. Okay. A week from today, before the next class. Okay, so got just, it. Okay. Just before the next class, finish the two midterms, come ready with your presentation. Thanks for that clarification. Okay. Uh, Torian, I saw either, looks like you were, had an arm that was up. Oh, I'm sorry? Yeah, can you? Hello? Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay, I was gonna ask a similar question because I looked at the calendar on Elms and it says the midterms I think are doing Thursday. Is it Thursday? Uh, what's the day? The 11th? Yeah, it yeah. says the 11th. All right, good news. You guys get a bonus day. <laughs> so I'm not gonna change it on you. If it says Thursday on the on Elms, I'm not gonna cut it back to Wednesday. So finish it by Thursday. Cool. Thank you. But I will say the presentations are definitely happening next week because I'm gonna be listening and you guys are gonna be talking. But I do have the right to ask you questions. And the, your answers to the questions, anyone on your team can answer them, but your grade will be dependent as well on the answer to those questions. And I'm not gonna try and gotcha questions, but as I said, the questions will generally come from two pieces of information. If you're giving data that looks different, like there's this giant increase in goodwill, probably gonna ask you who they bought. You know, big changes in the margins. You know, if something's going on, like I said, publicly with these companies, I might ask you about it and the impact of that. So those are the types of things that, you know, obviously if you're covering these companies, you're as a team, just pay attention to what's going on with both the data that you're looking at, because if it looks strange to you, it's probably gonna look strange to me. 
And the difference is I'm gonna ask you about it. And be topical. All right, any other questions? One last thing before we close, because I somebody, a couple of people would ask me about this, and I want to make sure you guys know it's here. When this is over, I've been recording this session. Um, I'm uploading this as a video to YouTube, and basically it's going to show up here under the modules tab. These are the live session videos. March 20th or March 13th, March 20th, March 27th. So later tonight, there'll be a video link right here for the April 3rd class. So as soon as I finish the session, I'll upload the YouTube so you'll have a copy of what we did tonight. They're available to you. Because again, people are asking about the videos. That's where they'll be, off the modules tab by each module. Those are the YouTube videos. All right, well, it is uh, 10, 13, so I'm gonna say we'll give everybody back two minutes of their time tonight and looking forward to your presentations next week. If you have any questions, email me throughout the week. And again, look for some additional data to show up in your team folders at this point sometime tomorrow. Have a good week and we'll see everybody next week. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.